Well, welcome to Find the Way on this Sunday, and uh, we're glad you've joined us. I'm Mike Sherbino, and with me today is my good friend Stan Biggs. Stan, thanks for being a part of our show. Oh, it's good to be here with you. Yeah, it's been a few months, and uh, so we're glad you're here, and uh, we've been hanging out together for the last couple of days, and that's uh, always been a treat in my life. But it's a treat right now that we're able to hang out with you as you're maybe uh, getting up, having your morning coffee, or maybe it's in the afternoon where you're listening to the show. But we're excited that Find the Way Now is going across the country from coast to coast, and that's due in part to the generosity of many of you folks who've been listening. So thank you for standing with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can write to us at uh, www.findtheway.faith. Send us your uh, questions, your comments. Uh, We're always glad to hear those things and to stay in touch with you. And one of the things that we want to do more than anything else on this program is to recognize that so many of you are coming from different backgrounds. Some of you come from a faith background. Some of you would say you're religious. Some of you say I'm not religious. Some of you have lots of questions. We're really glad you're listening today. And I'm going to be teaching today from a passage in the Bible that many of you have heard before. If you've ever gone to a wedding, likely they've read these verses. And in the essence of it, it's what Jesus talked about is really at the heart of the matter. What does real love look like? And uh, so for this week and next, we're going to be unpacking a passage in the book of 1 Corinthians. So uh, we're with you today, and uh, I want to begin by reading to you from 1 Corinthians 13. A guy by the name of the Apostle Paul, he writes these words, and he said, If I was to speak with the tongues of men and angels... Well, he said, I'm really just a sounding gong, clanging cymbal. He says, I just make a lot of noise. And he said, even if I have the gift of prophecy and could see into the future or can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and even if I have faith that I could move a mountain but have not love, I'm nothing. And if I give all that I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. So regardless of where we're coming from, I do think that Paul is speaking to something that is really at heart level for all of us because we see so much of the emptiness of people we see the brokenness of relationships possibly some of you listening today you're in the midst of a broken relationship and you're wondering what is this thing called love some of you have been disillusioned even by those who are part of the the christian faith supposed representatives of jesus and uh maybe you've given up even on church and many canadians have probably uh 85 percent don't go to a church and i've often wondered why so maybe that's a segue for our talk today because I was beginning to think, ask the question, if God were to pick a church that he would go to, what kind of church would it look like? And uh, because I think that if we knew that, we'd probably want to go there as well. And I think one of the things that we look for, not just in the church, we look for it in rotary groups, we look for it at our workplace, is that what we want is for people to be genuine. And uh, But looking for perfect people is really taking us down the wrong path because no one is perfect. We all have baggage. We all have struggles. And I have a dream, though, that as we walk this road together, that something miraculous will take place in your life and in mine. I have a dream that as we seek to know who Jesus is, that we'll want to distance ourselves from anything that is not authentic. And Paul writes this passage in Corinthians that we read from today, which is probably so familiar, just like the 23rd Psalm, because he knew that there needs to be a carpenter's plumb line or a baker's measuring cup. What do we, how do we come to life and say, this is the real thing? What, what do we measure ourselves up to? And this passage really, if anything, talks about separating the genuine from the fake. You know, Paul says that more than being a great orator or speaking with angelic tongues is the need to love. And he says, you can be a prophet and have these gift of mysteries and knowledge, which sounds pretty impressive. Um, And there's certain kinds of people that carry such an aura about them. But he said, if you don't have love, it really leaves you kind of empty. I think maybe that's part of the thing that we struggle with as we're watching the American uh, political scene these days. We see the saber rattling. We see the words traded. It's almost like sparring partners going into the ring. But we don't hear a lot of love. People are saying things and we say, what's the hidden agenda? And then suddenly they rip the other person apart. Well, Paul talks about another group of people as well, not just those that are incredible orators. It's the third group is even stranger. Those are the people who are martyrs for what they believe in. And there are some Christians who go around acting like they are martyrs. Maybe it'd be better if they did die, but almost as if the world does not deserve them. You know, they're just saying, oh, wow, 
you know, here I am. But he said, then there are others who give sacrificially to take care of the poor. Wow, that seems like great people to me. But then Paul comes back and he says, if you don't really have love, you have nothing. You see, Paul writes these statements in the first person. He puts himself in the hot seat so that no one would feel like he's pointing the finger at them. Yet the sense of conviction is evident. He's making a statement about who you and I are as potentially loving people. What does that mean for us today? Well, before Stan comes and helps me to unpack this passage, I heard a statement by Dr. Carl Menninger, the famous psychiatrist and founder of the Menninger Clinic, And he's written that love is the medicine for our sickle world. If people can learn to give and receive love, they'll usually recover from their physical or mental illness. Well, that's a powerful statement. The problem is that most people do not understand what true love is. Many people, including Christians, seem to think about it only in the terms of nice feelings, warm affection, romance, and desire. And when we say, I love you, we often mean, I love me and I want you. That, of course, is the worst case of selfishness. It's the very opposite of this unconditional love that the Bible talks about that's exemplified in the life of Jesus. And agape love is one of the rarest words in Greek literature, but one of the most common in the New Testament. It doesn't refer to sexual romantic love. It does not mean the close brotherly love, nor does it mean the love of charity associated with giving to the needy. What it means is self-giving love that demands something of us, love that is more concerned with giving than receiving. This love is as rare today in the church, in our lives and relationships as it was in the times of Paul. But the example is found in Jesus himself, who gave himself sacrificially on the cross. It's a sacrifice of self for the sake of others, even for others who might not care for us or who may even hate you. It's not a feeling, but it's an action, a determined act of will. It's the willing, joyful desire to put the welfare of others ahead of yourself. And it's that kind of love that people desperately are looking for, that I want to receive. But how more exciting to even think that I could be a person who, when I open my heart up to who Jesus really is, to say, you lead in love through me, that I can love. And I believe today that as we open ourselves up to God's love, it can transform our relationships. We're going to be right back in a moment with Stan Biggs. Welcome back to Find the Way. I'm Mike Sherbinal. With me today is uh, my good friend Stan Big. Stan, we're glad that you're here. Thank you. Stan, I'm going to nail you right out of the gate. Um, Do you think that there is a misunderstanding uh, when it comes to our understanding of God and this whole nature of love and how it impacts our lives. Absolutely. I think it, between people like you and I, we, we relate to the cartoon of each other instead of going backstage and discovering what's really going on. And I think one of the most surprising elements about God is that there's reciprocal vulnerability. In other words, he's not throwing bolts out of the sky. He, too, has got his sword laying down. He's invited us to sit talk, communicate, and he opens his heart. That can be rather intimidating, though, for people when you say those words, that God wants to sit, talk, to open his heart to us. Explain We don't that. want it. We don't want it. We just don't want it. Why, why is that? I think we're, by virtue of our own crippledness and brokenness, we don't think ourselves to be worthy of having a, that kind of conversation with anybody, much less the deity. And that's where that film that's been showing lately, The Shack, portrays a whole different understanding of what it means to be at the table with God, which in itself is crazy language to most ears. And yet the the idea of being at God's table is a metaphor that became an illustration when Jesus invites us to his table, the communion table. How, how do you tie that together? Well, you know, when we were on our honeymoon, I picked up... I went to we, home. not you and me, Stan, but no. you and Jan, <laughs> you and your wife, Jan. Let's Boy, just clarify you, that. How grateful I am for that fact. <laughs> We went to, one of my favorite things is to go to a bookstore. We went to Powell's in Portland. And do you know what I bought in that massive range of books was one book called The Velveteen Rabbit, which talks about vulnerability, talks about brokenness, talks about the animals coming alive. And the line that came out of that book that I I had no idea the extent to which it was true is that vulnerability hurts, real hurts. And if you look back on your marriage or your relationships or just life this last week, it hurts And for me, I'm increasingly discovering the extent to which God can and does come into 
our brokenness, our misunderstanding, our lostness, and he does so with infinite kindness and an awareness of our own respective idioms. You know, as you say that, I was thinking about, as we begun to look at this passage in Corinthians 13, mm-hmm. Paul talks aloud a lot of the people that had the fanfare. They do great things. They can speak very eloquently. Yeah. Paints a picture of people that we could only aspire to. But he said, really, it's all a sham if yeah. they don't yeah. have love. So why are we afraid to be vulnerable? Uh, I mean, that that's, that's a broad question. But as you think about that, wh- why do you shut down in some relationships or why do you open up? And maybe we can help our listeners think a little bit about that because I think most people have some relationships where they just feel like they've hit a brick road. Could the answer be within them? I suspect. And uh, I think all of us, you know, we sustain collateral damage uh, from our families of origin, school, the whole deal. And you know the greatest healing agency in, in our lives in our home is? Tell me. It's a little guy with Down syndrome called Jonathan Biggs. This is your son. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That little rascal has no pretense. He, he, he doesn't know how to lie. Well, he, he tries, but he'll tell you he's lying. <laughs> so that's not very good. <laughs> no. But what it does is it undresses. He will accept nothing else but real from his mom and I. In fact, from people around him. And so what, what, what he does is he reveals the extent of my own unwillingness to engage. And I have to stop in my weaker moments, look back and say, wait a minute, my father was busy. My father said to me one time, don't ever expect me to get on your crazy wavelength because I was wired way differently than he. And yet when this little guy comes along, Jonathan, he tied my dad and I together in an extraordinary sorts of ways and got over some of that uh, the default position of shut down, resent, pull back, cocoon, don't disclose, you know, that kind of routine. He draws you out. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Loves you out. And I've spent time with Jonathan, and what really bugs me about Jonathan is that he can clean my clock when we play the game Uno. Oh, yeah. Very frustrating, and he quite enjoys it as oh, well. Oh, yeah. I cheat as much as I can, and he still beats us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's something very, um, very vulnerable, and mm-hmm. yet there's a security that he has in who he is. And really the beauty of Jesus flows through him, which I think can become a great example to me to say, Lord, as I be open and vulnerable to you, then you can live and you can love through me. Absolutely. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about this. Uh, This conversation is more like just stripping it down to the bare bones. What is the essence of faith? What does it mean to know God, to love him? And right now we want to listen to a song by Hillsong Worship called Cornerstone. And we'll be right back. trust the sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Come on, every voice. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. The sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, we can make strong in the Savior's love. Through
Welcome back to the second half of uh, today's program on Find the Way. I'm Mike Sherbino, and with me is Stan Big. Stan, we're glad that you're here. Yeah, I'm really glad to be with you. And you were talking um, just before we broke for the song uh, by Hillsong Worship on the whole thing of vulnerability. And your son, Jonathan, who has Down syndrome, uh, how has he taught you to be vulnerable as a person? Unpack that for us. Well, <laughs> when you experience such raw unconditional love from a human being you simply cannot maintain pretense i uh, sometimes you know how it is when you're a little bit ticked off in traffic never happened to me no really. not me either maybe once well john will say da calm down <laughs> don't worry da it okay and then he'll look at me every day and say something like this he'll say da da he care for you he care for you well that just strips you bare and 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 you can do nothing else but let the rubble and the rabble of the day just evaporate, especially when he has his little arms wrapped around you, calming. Well, you know, as I begin to think about that, let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians for a few moments because this is the passage on love. And uh, Paul has been talking about all these people with exceptional gifts and abilities, and some are eloquent orators and some are giving to the poor and doing mm-hmm. great things, which are, are all fine in their right place. But he said, if you don't have love, it really is nothing. And it seems to me that when Jesus modeled uh, here on earth his life, it really was upside down living. Uh, not only was it upside down living, but I also like to call it second story living. Yeah. It's just when I look and say, wow, I'm going to look at this differently. I'm not going to let that person get the better of me. And whereas as we live in the day-to-day world, we're constantly fighting, you know, who's out to get me? Who's got a hidden agenda? Who wants to take me down? And it seems that as you have learned from your son, Jonathan, who just continues to love, uh, even when he's been hurt, it's almost like the analogy of the dog. You know, you can yell at the dog. Some people kick the dog. And yet the amazing thing is the dog's always wagging its tail when you come home. There's like an unconditional love. No wonder he's called man's best friend. for sure. Well, Jesus said some things that were the, the, the kind of upsetting to me because in my own strength, I can't attain to it. Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. And then Paul wrote these words in Ephesians. He said, if God so loved us that even while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more should we love those who are our enemies? Mm-hmm. And so this week and next, as we unpack what love looks like, I'm not sure that I feel comfortable going there uh, in my humanity because there are people I know who don't like me, and, and yet God is saying, I want you to love them. On the other hand, I'm grateful that God loves me and that Jesus has reached out to me. You know, I think that uh, one of the things that maybe I probably shouldn't admit in public, but I'll do it anyways, is that I'm quite gullible. And by that I mean that when it comes to uh, people and what they say, I tend to believe them. Probably like you, Stan, I've had many experiences where once I've got to know someone, I've discovered that what I first thought was true at the beginning isn't. And unfortunately, I have to confess, and maybe you, our listeners as well, uh, to there have been times when I've pretended to be someone that I really wasn't. Because you see, I believe we all have a tendency to go easy on ourselves. We can look at others and say that they seem to be full of themselves, but let ourselves off the hook. And sometimes we come with a chip on our shoulder and everyone else seems to be in the wrong when in reality it is just us. Uh, The great uh, essayist and writer C.K. Chesterton once wrote an answer to a public essay question in England years ago. And the subject was, what's wrong with the world? His answer, his huge essay, his response was just two words, uh, unlike everyone else's. And what was the answer to the question, what's wrong with the world? He said, I am. I'm what's wrong. I mean, he was willing to own it. So this morning, the question is, how do, I, how do we change the, the I am? What is it that we have to do to be the kind of people that we deep within ourselves want others to be to us? And the answer is that we can't be that kind of person, at least not in our own strength. We need the supernatural power and help of the Holy Spirit, God's presence. His Spirit can enable us to be who and what he's created us to be. Uh, That means that I can be the kind of person that my wife was hoping she married so many years ago. Um, The Corinthians who Paul was writing this letter to were not walking in the spirit. 
They were selfish, self-designing, self-willed, self-motivated, and doing everything possible to promote their own interests and welfare. There was little regard for the other person, and they were not lacking in any gift, but they were lacking in spiritual fruit. What they lacked more than anything else was love. And so Paul teaches through the extreme use of exaggeration to get the point across about the importance of love. And we've already referenced it, but Paul says eloquence without love is nothing. Paul says that if I could speak like an angel with various languages but don't have love, then I'm just like a noisy gong or clanging cymbals. Imagine being able to speak like an angel. I was with a man some time ago who was noted as being one of the top 25 communicators in the English language. When he spoke, it was absolutely brilliant. And uh, he was surrounded for, at this one time when I was with him with 24 preachers for three days. As hard as it is to believe, when he spoke, all those preachers remained silent. Now, the Corinthians prided themselves in oratory and also in knowing several languages. Oratory was to them what the music of a Michael Bublé or Celine Dion is to us. And Paul says, without love, you are empty. Matter of fact, if we don't walk our talk, then that's all it is, talk. And in Paul's time, the Corinthians would honor their pagan gods by speaking in ecstatic noises that were accompanied by clanging cymbals, smashing gongs, and blaring trumpets. All of it was babble if you don't have love. So can I just say to you today that, you know, maybe you're saying all the words to the people that are around you. But down deep, they know if you love them. And if your words are just empty talk, could it be that God is speaking to you today, even through this program, to say, it's time for a change. Uh, it's time to realize that no longer do we want just the fluff on the top. People want people to be individuals of substance. It's probably why we struggle so much as we're looking at the political scene right now, the words that we say, the empty rhetoric, and wondering, who can we believe? But is there someone who will put my interests ahead of theirs. And we have a Savior who has done that. And that's why he went to the cross. And that is the power of the Christian faith. It says we have a Savior who emptied himself so that we can be filled with his very presence and his character. Stan is going to be back with us in just a moment as we talk more about what this love looks like. Welcome back to Find the Way. I'm Mike Sherbino, your host today and, uh, and speaker. And with me is Stan Biggs in the studio. Welcome back again, Stan, as you've been sharing a little bit of your own journey, your journey with your son, Jonathan. And I just want to say to our listeners today that you can connect with us if you write to us online. Find us online at www.findtheway.faith. Not .com, but findtheway.faith. We'd love to hear from you. And it's your ongoing gifts that keep this ministry afloat as we are reaching across the country. So thank you uh, for your partnership with us. As we begin to talk and continue to talk about this whole subject of love, um, Stan, let me ask you a question. What do you think are some of the blocks that keep us from experiencing the kind of love that I've been referring to out of the passage here today in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul talks about something that's very genuine, very authentic. What are some of those blocks in your mind? I think if some divine diagnostic person could say, here are the blocks, and he would draw them on a piece of it, we wouldn't recognize, understand what's going on. Why is that? Because I think we're so enculturated in relig religious language that we've lost the capacity to deal with the real. For example, okay. uh, we, talk, we use words like gospel like good news. And I'm convinced that the original good news, whatever that was, uh, as Jesus and the disciples talked about, has little, if anything, to do with the privatized, individualized brand of in-my-closet religion that we experience today. Wow, that's and, a strong statement. And so if, if I view myself as a privatized individual dealing with the, the, the divine on my own rather than being part of a, a, a narrative that is highly inclusive and extends beyond my own culture, my own century, my own continent. There's a big story happening, and my story has to do with that. Talk to me about the narrative part. Explain that to our listeners, because I think that that's a key part. Well, it's one thing that, you know, Rick Warren and others talk about the purpose-driven life. And I wonder if, if the purpose that governs all of us reflects that collective 
intent that has it pre-exists our own advent on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And so if we were to have a, a bigger, broader view of, say, the word salvation, more than just getting a ticket to heaven so that when you die, you got some place to reside in the suite by and by. <laughs> Let's suppose in the intent goes far beyond that. For example, when you and I got married, we didn't get married so we could have children. I'm suggesting that children were a byproduct of that. Okay. When I opened my heart up to the, what deem, I deem to be the overtures of, of God to me, if I get lost in behavioral codes or trying to subscribe to getting it right, what is just the right way to believe, let's suppose that God cares far more about my trust than he does my correct belief. And that's where Jonathan comes in, right? Because when that little guy comes home from swinging and singing and he's alive with something, and we go down to the, down to the Lakeview Market to get some yogurt. He loves peach yogurt. Do you know that when he walks into that place, every single uh, checkout person looks and says, Hi, John. There's people in the store that say, John, how have you been? How long do you think I stay miserable in that environment or impatient? <laughs> Or just, you know what I'm saying? So if I can throw something in there, so they don't really care if Jonathan is a Baptist, a Pentecostal, or any of those Protestant groups, or if he's Catholic or Jewish. Doesn't enter their heads. Doesn't even enter their heads. In fact, when we're driving along, every stop sign, you know what he does? He'll look over and wave and blow a kiss or smile to the person that's driving. And we've got to the point where that's a major part of going anywhere. Because you know what the people do? They become themselves. They just... The, all the, uh, the cement and, and personalities that are driven by the temper of the times or whatever just melts away, and these real people are looking back. And just like that with the Western Hockey League team, John works with the Rockets. The Kelowna and, Rockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when he goes into that dressing room, those young men are free to be, not the men they're supposed to be, but the young men they really are. And there's a brand of love and acceptance and kindness that's infectious. So when I hear about that, I'm drawn into it because those are the kind of relationships I want to have with people. I want that level of vulnerability. Yeah. But I do put blocks up because I've been hurt. That's one of the things people have hurt me. So I'm afraid, well, I'm not sure I'm going to open up again. Or what if I don't measure up because I have the block of measuring my own success? How do I move past that stand? We've only got like a minute left in our show today. But help me to move through that as an individual. Well, if we can remember that most of us uh, won't tolerate emotional relationships uh, in, in communication, um, we, we would rather... How do, how, do, how do I put this? Defend our dishonesty on the grounds we might hurt others. Wow. And having rationalized our phoniness into nobility, we satisfy ourselves with superficial relationships. We've got to get out of that. We all hunger for something more. We all hunger for friendship, connection, relationship. And I tell you what, I'm to the point where I begin to welcome the things that will break me out of my inauthentic madness, absence of truth, to the point where, like my little son, I can wander along the real me, not the pretend me. And that's where the freedom's coming. That's a powerful thought as we think about in our brokenness, that's when we discover Christ. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Us, be with us. You've been listening to Find the Way with uh, Mike Sherman and Stan Biggs. We're going to be back next week to pick up this same subject again. Thanks, Stan, for being here. Thank you.